Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri. Today we're gonna to do a quick video on the any and all function inside of R. Um, so let's just type out here in our notes, intro to any and all. And so what these do is exactly what you would expect here. So it'll say any, if anything inside of some object here, so we could say like anything in X, uh, and then it will either return uh, true or false. So it gives you a Boolean value the same for any and all, but let's just do a quick example here and see how this works. So let's create X and we'll create X so that it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And we'll hit control enter and run that. And you'll see over here we have X now, which is one to 12. Um, let's just start with any. So if any of the values of X are going to be less than five, and this should give us true. So it prints out true. Um, you can do any um, of x is going to be equal to two, and again, it'll print out true. Okay, to get a fault here, let's just say any of x is going to be greater than, let's say 14, we'll run this and we get false, okay? So this is any value. So just one of these values inside of this object have to meet the condition and it will provide you with a true. If none of them provide it, then it provides a false. Um, all works almost the exact same way here. So let's say all values within X are going to be um, greater than zero. So that provides true. Um, if you did something that was going to be false here, it'd be any value or all values inside of X uh, are going to be less than 10 and it provides false. And the reason being here is obviously that 11 and 12 are going to be greater than X. So not all of the conditions meet it. And so therefore it's still going to give you a false. Okay. So now that we see how the any and all functions work, uh, let's build a quick function here. It's gonna seem kind of pointless. You think it's kind of an odd exercise. And then at the very end, I'll try to explain quickly uh, how this is actually used in a real world application. Again, I'm not gonna build the entire application out, um, but I'll give you the logic and then you can kind of see, okay, this has some actual practical uh, use, at least in the finance sector here, specifically in credit risk. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a function and we want this function um, to look for runs inside of some you know, vector here. Could be a matrix, something else like that. Um, but we want runs of the number one, okay? So to define that, we're gonna say, you know, let's create the function called find runs. Why not name it something simple that we'll understand? Uh, type in function. So this is the function that creates functions. And then we want to be able to input two things inside of this. Let's say our input data, so we'll call it input D. I don't like calling things X or Y or like random names because then you'll forget what it's actually supposed to do. It makes your code hard to read in the future. So when you name things, make sure you use useful names. And then also we want the run length, okay? So let's just create the Y here real quick. Okay, so we're gonna call something Y, just a random data set. And we're just going to fill it with zeros and ones. And we'll just fill it up so that there's a total of 13. So we'll fill it up so there's 13 numbers inside this vector. We'll hit control enter and run this. Um, you'll see it saves it up here 1 to 13. And what we're trying to do here is we want to look at this and say a run length. So for example, if um, run length is going to be equal to 2. Right, and what we're wanting to do is look at this list and runs of two. So look at the first two and say, hey, uh, are these both ones? So are all of these ones? Nope, okay, that's false, so don't do anything. And then do the second window here. So we're gonna iterate through this uh, vector and we're gonna say, okay, next to the vector is gonna be this one. Are these all ones? Nope, okay, don't do anything. And then finally, when we hit the third one, we're gonna say, hey, these are all ones, it's true. Let's save this first place here of three. So we would save three and we'd go through here and look at all these and you'll end up with three, four, five, and nine, okay? So 
nine would be this last piece here, but we would not save six because it'd be one and zero, right? They're not a run of ones. And we're gonna save these all together. Now, if you wanted to do something more useful with this, different, different aspect here, but something that comes to my mind, uh, you could just type in length of, you know, whatever these are saved as, which you'll see in a second here. But we'll call these runs. We'll say rank, length of runs. And this would give you a total of four. So there's four objects or numbers inside of this. Um, and that would give you, okay, there's four runs. But you'll see in a second why positioning and the credit example here is kind of useful. Um, so we're going to create this function. We're going to use curly brackets and then we're going to hit enter and it will automatically enter the curly bracket to end it lower. It'll end it here so we can start writing our function. And what we're going to want to do is first we're going to want to count and see how long is this vector, okay? Because we want to tell it like, hey, we're going to iterate from the beginning to the end. But remember, we can't iterate from 1 to 13 because if we're looking at a window of 2, 13 would be here and we'd be trying to look at something after the last digit and there's nothing there. So let's just start off with we're going to need to know at least the length of the vector and we can do some math to kind of adjust it so it doesn't over count and throw us an error. We'll just call this n, so the number of length here. And we'll say, okay, what is the length of my input data? And then next we're going to create another variable, so as I mentioned up here, called runs. And we're going to type in runs and we're going to say this is going to be null. So null just means empty. We want an empty list, right? Because we want to fill it up with the different positions of where the runs are going to be located. And then finally, we're going to have to do a for loop with an if statement, right? Because we wanted to go through this, like I said, right? Here's the for loop. So do this how many times? So look at the first window, which is the first step of the for loop. And then we're going to say, hey, if these are all give me true and do something. So save the run. Um, if this is false, don't do anything because I don't really care. And then go to the second one. So now we're going to go back to the for loop a second time and say go from two to three and say, hey, is this true? Right? Are all of these ones false? Don't do anything. And then finally, yes, from three to four is true. Save three and then do that and reiterate through the entire list. Okay. So like I mentioned, we're going to have to have a for loop to be able to loop through the list. And we always do i in 1, so we want to start with 1. And we want to go to um, n minus run length plus 1. Okay, so it's going to seem a little odd, but n is going to be the total length here, so it's 13. Um, the run length we picked is 2, okay? So 13 minus 2 is going to give us 11, and then we're going to plus 1, which is going to be 12. If you look, there's actually 12 pairs in total. So don't believe me, right? Take an arbitrary number like five runs of five. You can do this nine times. So you can loop this window through nine times here. Um, so if we did n here, it'd still be 13. Run length is going to be five now. So that'd be eight. So 13 minus five is going to give you eight. Plus one is going to be nine. And as I just mentioned, right, uh, if you loop this through, it can do it nine times. The math checks out. That's logically how we would do it so that it's flexible and can take different run lengths. Um, if you're only looking, for example, for lengths of two, you could just hard code this, but we're not going to do that. We're going to make it a little more flexible and a little more useful. And then next, we're going to do a curly bracket and hit enter. So the curly bracket here is going to say, hey, in this for loop, what do we want it to do? Okay, so now we're going to do an if statement here. So if all, right, so if all the values in the input data from the window of i, two and then we're going to do i plus run length okay minus one if that window is equal to one that's going to be the true statement so let's look at this for a second here if all the values inside of the vector that you're going to input into here from position i to i plus run length minus one so let's look at an example here so if this is one this number is going to be 1 plus 2, which is our run length, which gives us 3. Minus 1 is going to be 2. So this is from 1 to 2. So this is the first window. Now let's say, hey, let's run through this the second run. So now i is going to be iterated up to 2. So 2 is what we're going to start at. And then we're going to go 2 plus the run length, which is 2. So 2 plus 2 is 4. Minus 1 is going to be 3. This is going to be from 2 to 3, which gives us the second window. So yes, it is working as we expect. So basically we're saying if, you know, the window we're looking at, if everything in here, 
is equal to one, right? So what we're gonna do here is create a variable called runs and we're gonna combine runs and i. So let's look at this real quick before we end the function. Um, we do the first window and it's false. So if you know this is false, nothing happens. But if you end up at position three here, for example, and if window three, all of these is true and they are equal to one, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, we're gonna create a variable called runs and we already have a variable called runs right here, which is up here at the beginning as null. We're gonna take the empty one and we're gonna combine it with the new value, which is three, and we're gonna reset it to runs. And that's gonna be now just a vector of three. When we iterate again through now, we get to the fourth position and we come back, runs is already gonna have three inside of it. And now we're gonna add the new value of four. And so now runs is gonna contain three and four. And you'd go through this whole iteration process and end up with three, four, five, and nine, right? And it runs all that. After it does all this and it creates all these values, right? What we're gonna to wanna to do is return runs. So I wanna print this and save it and say, hey, runs is gonna be three, four, five, and nine. So it'll print it out here and it'll return that value to us, okay? So let's just highlight this and do control enter. It'll run it. And then let's just try our function out here. So let's do find runs and we're gonna put our input data, which is gonna be Y and let's do runs of two, hit control enter. It'll give us three, four, five, and nine. So again, it checks out with our testing. Now let's just run it through its paces and say, hey, let's do something different here. So let's do Y and let's look at our data. The longest run we have is a four which you could build this more complex to check and say, hey, there's no runs or whatever. Um, but you can run to say, let's do runs of three or let's just do runs of four, right? We know there's just one of them. It should you know, generate one at three and hit control enter and it generates three. Now let's see when we put something ridiculous in. So let's just say find runs y of, I don't know, let's say six. We'll run that, right? Just says null. So essentially runs was null to start with. It ran through, it didn't find any, and it just generates null. If you look at this, I saved some of this code so you can kind of walk through it. Um, if we are gonna take a numerical example here, kind of as I explained, and you simplify it down, right? N's gonna be equal to 13 inside of our equation, that length. And then the null is gonna be the same and run will be, well, it's not zero, it'll be empty, so it'll be null when it starts. And then it'll start off with i, and it'll do one, two, and in our case, we have our run, our total n, which is 13, our run length is two, so 13 minus two plus one, if you look down here, gives us 12. And then that second line here, right, we had all from i to i plus two minus one, so in this case, it'd be i plus one, and it can run through the values. And if you actually ran this through, and you can look at this one by one. So I encourage you guys to go do this by hand and see how this actually works. It'll help you understand how the functions work and it'll help you build logic so you can write your own functions later in the future. Um, but we're gonna look at this window here and i is equal to one and we run the iterations and we say, okay, from i from one to two, you know, if all the ones are true, else false, generates false looks at the second window when i is two and now goes from two to three. Again, it's false, does three, so three to four, it's true, runs is now equal to three, goes to four, looks at the fourth window here from four to five, says, are these true? Yes, these are true. Take runs, right? Take this old value of runs, which has three in it, and add four to it, and now it's gonna be, runs is gonna be equal to three and four, okay? So that's just kind of how it works. That's how the algorithm works. But let's just look at a real world example on this. So in credit risk, um, we have something called um, gains tables. And what we end up doing is taking, let's say a million records and we end up segregating them into 10 bins. But to do that, we want each bin um, to have give or take 10% in that bin the data is already pre-sorted. So I wanna see how each bin is performing, the worst to the best, for example, or the best for the worst, depending on how you set it up. Um, what you'd end up with was, you'd end up with a bin, okay? 
and you'd have your bends, and this would be like a column in a matrix. But you'd have bend one, you know, bend two, and then you'd have, you know, bend dot 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 all the way down to bend 10. And then you could have something like range. So this would be the range of your bends. And this should be like 0 0.00, say to like 0 0.09. And then you'd have like 0 0.09 to, I don't know, 0 0.118. And then, of course, your final bend would be something like, I don't know, 0 0.89 to 1.0 because your probability of default here is a probability. It goes from 0 to 1. And these would be the bends. And then you'd end up having things such as count of each bend. And so you'd have numbers in here like, I don't know, hypothetically, you should have around 100,000 in each bend. But in the real world, that's not how this works. A lot of times you have like 99,000 in like, I don't know, 90. And I'll explain why this is true. So what we end up doing is when you create this list, you'd have some massive list of say like, I don't know, let's call this Y again here. And Y would be a vector such that you'd have like 0 0.01, 0 0.01, 0 0.02. Okay, we have a bunch of these. And then we'd have uh, like 0 0.07. 0 0.07, 0 0.09. And we want to have a total of 10 of these to make the math easy. Oh yeah, I'll say 90% here. What we end up doing is we want to create these bends. So in this case, let's say we want five bends because there's not very much data right here. But what we'd want to do is split it and say, okay, there's a total of 10. Each bend should have two. So you'd split it and say, okay, there's going to be a split here. And there's going to be a split here and there's going to be a split here and then finally there's going to be a split here okay so you'd have five bends in total each with two so the reason this is having issues is when we do bending in credit risk we want to keep the numbers together so the first split first bend has these values second bend has these values no problem there but when this second main split here comes and it splits these there's someone in the next bend, 0.02, and someone in the second bend, 0.02, that hypothetically have the same value. So your numbers aren't going to be consistent and normal, and it's going to be hard to draw inference from these and look at monotonicity within your bending. So don't worry about that word right now. Don't worry about all the bending concepts. But in general, I want this you know, value, since it's the same as the other ones, to be moved to this side. So I want to move the split so that we have all the values that are the same together. Now remember, in credit risk, you're gonna have millions and millions of observations here. So when you move them around here, right, I'm not gonna get equally 10% in each bend. There might be like, oh, 10 people got moved from, you know, I don't know, say this one is one more. So 10 people from this bend got shuffled over to this bend. That's okay as long as I have everyone with the same values in the same bend. So like our example above, right, we're looking for ones, in this case, we're looking for similarities. So we want to check inside of our bins here and say, hey, is the value before and the value after our split the same? So are all of these values in this window of two, are they the same? Yes or no? If yes, then a lot of times you have to iterate either left or right inside of your list, or you can do what I do, which is create a function that counts how many are the same on the left and counts how many are the same on the right, then takes the smaller number and then moves it to the other side. Again, it's a more complicated function to do it. But in general, right, we don't want to have uh, people that have the same values to be split into two different groups. And so this is a real world example of how you would actually use um, the all statement to be able to do that and to move them and split them around. And yes, this is actually how we do it in practice uh, when I create gains tables for credit risk and just finance in general. So anyways, I hope you guys found that video helpful. If you did, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. And thank you to all those that support me on Patreon. And as always, until next time.